Hi, I'm Beckman Berserker and welcome back to my channel. A question I'm often asked repeatedly is, why Beckme? Why not Advanced Dungeons and Dragons? Or even why not a retro clone like Old School Essentials, or others like that? Well, my first response is to say that I like all those games, and that, when it comes down to playing and DMing them, then they are almost the same as Beckme. They are Old School D&D, and they are extremely interchangeable to a point where you could pick up adventure modules for all these versions of the game and run them with very little effort at conversion, if you even want to bother converting them at all. But what I go on to say is what some of you may be familiar with me repeating. Beckme is the only version of the game that, within its core rules, goes beyond the adventuring element and provides a system that enables players to establish and rule dominions, as well as providing rules for going to war, so that those dominions may be defended or expanded. So I thought my first Beck Me Adventure module review should really focus on a publication that capitalised on these elements of the game. An adventure module that literally expanded your campaign world and facilitated dominion and conquest, whilst providing a tense political backdrop. This publication is, of course, CM1, Test of the Warlords. Test of the Warlords was written by Douglas Niles and published in 1984, the same year as the companion rules were released, which detailed dominion play. The adventure module was described as being for character levels 15 and above, and was only 32 pages in length, and, as with all adventure modules of that day, was detached from its external cover to double as a DM's screen, the content of which I'll come on to soon. The first thing to say about this module was how it was framed. On the first page we are told that Test of the Warlords is a campaign adventure. Well, what is a campaign adventure, and how does it differ from the adventures we've been previously offered? Well, we are told that Test of the Warlords serves as a framework for companion level play, and that it doesn't focus on a single scenario. So it isn't a typical, things have gone wrong and you guys need to fix it kind of adventure. It is in fact a mini campaign. We are offered several adventures within this framework, all with a strong connection with the region and politics. But how these adventures fit together within the backdrop of the characters obtaining, maintaining and defending land is largely left up to the Dungeon Master meaning they have quite a bit of flexibility in approach. As a matter of fact, Test of the Warlords is set over a period of up to two years, allowing for the play of these adventures to occur simultaneously with the development and maintenance of each character's dominion. This is a far cry from the classic quest adventures which we've been used to, and a clear difference is how the Beckley game could be played compared to other versions of D&D. So with that bit of background, i better give you some information on what this campaign adventure entails. How do the characters get involved, and why would they be interested anyway? Test of the Warlords is set in a region of the known world called Norwald, an obvious rendering of Northworld. If you are familiar with the known world as presented in the Blue Box Expert Rules and Isle of Dread module, then you can see where I've highlighted the proximity of that region to Norwald on this map found in CM1. Up to recently, this unsettled region has been contested by the Empire of Thyatis and a power we'd not been made aware of before in the Beckme line, called the Empire of Alphacia. The impact of reading this information as a 13-year-old dungeon master was quite profound. Here in this adventure module, not only were we being informed of great swathes of land beyond that of the known world, but there are empires out there as well, and powerful ones at that. This was hinted at on the final page of the dungeon master's book in the companion rules, but here we are told that Alphacia is the oldest empire in the world, founded on the concepts and learnings of magic, and it is Alphacia that has made a direct play for Norwald, establishing a kingdom there and sending messengers throughout the known world, offering ambitious men and women the chance to own land and rule, in return for swearing fealty to the king. Just consider this concept for a moment. Your reward for taking part in this adventure was not just experience points and gold. Here you are being offered a reason, a point in taking part, beyond defeating the naughty villain. Your character was going to own land, carve out a dominion, and influence the shaping of that land. And who knows, if the king's throne looks nice and shiny, maybe someone else's backside should be warming it. Although I found no difficulty in getting my players to consider establishing dominions in Norwald, the text does suggest nudging the players by explaining that the lands they have been adventuring in are becoming more stable, and that there are lean pickings on the adventuring scene, especially for ones as powerful as themselves. This is where the inside cover of the module can prove useful, as it details a player's map of Norwald, upon which they are invited to stake a claim for a dominion. 
with fantastically named locations like Frosthaven and the Worm's Teeth Range, the imagination should be sufficiently intrigued to find out what lies there. However you get them there, the characters arrive in Norwald's capital, the city of Alpha, in time for the Spring Festival, where the king evaluates his candidates, amongst which are some pretty nefarious NPCs. Test of the Warlords gives us a prologue detailing how to run and use this adventure, which is then separated into seven further sections. These are the setting, which presents the geography and features of Norwald, and information on some of its inhabitants. Then there's a section on non-player characters, which introduces King Erikal of Norwald, the aristocracy, and other dramatis personae. The adventure proper kicks off with the land grab section, which sets out the requirements for claiming and being offered a dominion. Then there's major events, consisting of two high-profile events that offer the players the opportunity to enhance their character's reputation. Norwald Encounters consists of five mini-scenarios that again take place over the two years, each being season-specific, and each of these scenarios relating to the conflict between Alphacia and Thyatis in some way. Then there is the War of the Crown, which is the main climax of the adventure, building on the previous events, the alliance is made, or not, and the use of the War Machine system that can be found in the Companion Rules, as Thyatis moves against Alphacia in an attempt to steal Norwald away for itself. Who will the players side with? Well, it's all up for grabs in true Game of Thrones fashion. You just hope to choose the winning side. The seventh and final part is called Continuing the Campaign, and really is just an offer of five more scenario ideas for when the War of the Crown is over, and the characters return to their dominions to face whatever threats that might present themselves. It's worth mentioning that both CM2 Death's Ride and CM3 Sabre River are also set in Norwald, so expanding a campaign beyond this module is an easy prospect. Okay, I've mentioned that all of this occurs over a time frame of up to two years, but how? And why? Why can't one just hurry the timeline up a bit? Well, you can, but in my opinion it would render the game unrealistic in terms of time, and time is very important when it comes to ruling a dominion. But just how did the characters obtain one of these dominions anyway? Well, there are four stipulations that are followed in the land grab section. First, the character must be 15th level or above. Although this information is pretty meta, I would translate this as one's reputation preceding them. Secondly, the character must swear fealty to King Erikal of Norwald, son of Ariadna the Wise, Empress of all Alphacia. Critically, the character must pledge to pay a standard rate of tax on all income earned through their dominion. If characters are willing to establish their dominion in a wilderness area, they may be excused paying tax for two years due to adverse logistics. I'll cover the differences between civilised, borderlands and wilderness dominions in a moment. Finally, the characters must declare no affiliation with the Empire of Thyatis, and promise to expose any Thyatian plot if realised. So, pretty simple then. Well, sort of. The DM is informed in the text that they should ensure that some of the NPCs also seeking a dominion have chosen the same regions as the players. This sets the scene for a tournament or some kind of contest between a player character and an NPC, the outcome of which may result in a stretched relationship between the two. The shape of this tournament is left up to the DM. But once again we are invited to lean into the companion rules, which details the running of tournaments and offers suggestions on the kinds of events that might be present. Ultimately, King Erikal is seeking people of strong repute, willing to stand behind him in return for a slice of the wild country, so a test of arms seems an appropriate way of doing this. In respect of dominions, I cover them somewhat in my review of the companion rules, but essentially, the size of a dominion at its time of establishment is typically 1 hex, or 24 miles. The companion rules suggest that a dominion is in a civilised area if it is 1 to 6 hexes from a city or large town. In a borderlands area if it is within 1 to 3 hexes from a civilised area, and that all other areas are called wilderness. In a newly exploited land such as Norwald, I would err on the lower end of these numbers when it comes to civilised areas, as it doesn't seem to make much sense that civilised lands could extend to 144 miles out from a large settlement. In my Norwald campaign, anything beyond 24 miles should be borderlands, but I have the borderlands section be the full 3 hex distance, or 72 miles, before it becomes wilderness, purely so that the tax incentive I spoke about earlier is not so exploitable. That's just how I do it, but you can let me know if you do it differently in the comments. Characters electing a dominion in a civilised area follow the standard companion rules for determining the number of resources it has, 
which is up to a maximum of 4 per hex. However, those who have elected to rule dominions in borderlands or wilderness areas may reap more rewards in terms of resources available in each hex and how large their starting dominions may be when accommodating these resources. The trade-off is clearly isolation from support should a borderlands or wilderness dominion come under threat, but in my experience, most players want to be as far away from someone else's authority as possible. So now that we've covered how the players might end up with the Dominion, let's check out that adventure timeline. Within Test of the Warlords, we are offered a suggested timeline of events that spans two years, which I see no reason to deviate from if you want the game to flow easiest. But again, it's up to you. I've put the details of the timeline on the screen for you to examine. So as you can see, the timeline is separated into seasons. It starts with the Spring Festival and the claiming of Dominions and the next suggested event does not occur until the summer. Obviously, the intent here is to get players to begin developing their dominions, using the time between spring and summer to build what they can with what they can access in those areas, whilst attracting families to work the land. How all this might work is explained in the companion rules, and would largely play out as a bit of an administrative exercise. That might not sound very exciting, but as I've mentioned in previous videos, if it wasn't fun, sim games wouldn't be a thing. However, and this is a key point, there is no reason why a dungeon master can't insert their own little scenarios into these sections of the timeline. A player might be building a tower in the foothills of the Worm's Teeth range, but that doesn't mean that they might not incur the wrath of a long-established humanoid tribe. DMs are encouraged to bring the land to life as much as possible, so there is an opportunity for DMs to stretch their creative muscle, consult with no one, and make the campaign their own. So the wizard Felonius the Shrewd may be forced by the DM to deal with a pack of hungry goblins, but he's charismatic enough to convince them to help him build his dungeon, and in return he'll make sure they have a place to live and won't be bothered, except for when needed for the odd experiment or three. And so this is how the format of running Test of the Warlords might work. I say might because each DM might use the framework of the module differently, and once the summer event of the Dungeons of Quill is conducted, the characters may again indulge in the Dominion side of things, possibly capitalising on any extra scenarios their DM has thought of before the Autumn event, and so on. There are two major events in this timeline that deserve greater focus, as they offer the characters opportunities to interact with the Royal Court, and also build their reputations, with potential rewards including more land. These are presented in reverse order in the module for some reason, but the first occurrence of these major events is a Frost Giant invasion, that takes advantage of a particularly severe winter to cross the frozen sea from Frosthaven to Norwald to take part in some extensive raiding. These frost giants number 2,000, but separate into numerous bands of around about 100 giants each to plunder settlements wherever they can be found. As newly established rulers of Norwald, it is up to the party to locate and defeat these bands of giant raiders and send them back to Frosthaven. What's key to this scenario is that we're introduced to the use of the War Machine, a mass combat system detailed in the companion rules, and also credited in part to Douglas Niles. The characters are welcome to face 100 giants at a time in single combat, but would find more success in deploying what forces they have at their disposal. And this points to a key element of Dominion play. It's easy to list off your resources and gain income from them, but how do you defend them? How much will it cost? How well equipped are your soldiers? and how well trained are they? All these are factors that need to be figured out in the Dominion aspect of this campaign adventure. If you've not bothered with the defence of your realm as yet, then it's likely to get overrun, and King Ericle is likely to view your contribution dimly. This Frost Giant invasion culminates with either their defeat, or a tactical withdrawal to cross back to Frosthaven before the sea ice melts, the latter probably meaning they'd be mostly successful in obtaining masses of plunder and weakening Norwald. That said, if the giants have been defeated, and the characters performed heroically, the king may reward them with more land, meaning more income and more influence. Ultimately, the king has developed a clear assessment of those that rule in his land, and this should come into play as the game moves forward. The second major event is a royal wedding. King Ericle is betrothed to a childhood friend from Alphacia, a young magic user called Christina Marie Alanira and the scenario plays out as a kind of who's who of NPC interactions that might happen at court. So there is plenty of opportunity for role playing here and playing up some of those adversaries of the characters, who I'll get to a little later. In addition to this backdrop, we are informed of three specific scenarios that play out during the wedding week. 
The first is referred to as A Night on the Town, and is an opportunity for the player characters to accompany a mischievous Christina on a trip into the common areas of the City of Alpha, as she wants to experience more of the life she will be ruling over. Despite using polymorph spells to disguise everyone, Christina and her chaperone have been shadowed by Thiatian agents, who take the opportunity to try to kidnap her in a sufficiently appropriate dark alley. The strength of this encounter is quite high, so fending off the kidnappers is no easy task. Obviously, defeating the kidnappers should mean getting Christina back to safety. There is no specific reward detailed for this, so I would presume this outcome to be a secret kept between Christina and the party, with Christina remembering her saviours with fondness. However, if the party lose and Christina is kidnapped, then we are told that the kidnappers ransom her for 1 million gold pieces. How this plays out would be up to the DM, and how their campaign is currently set up, but clearly, King Erical would not be pleased. The second scenario is called the Black Avengers, Avengers being the opposite of Paladins of course. Essentially, Christina's honour is called into question during a pre-wedding feast by four intruders dressed in black plate mail, who seek battle with anyone who contests their assertion. Although this text doesn't specifically say so, you could link this questioning of honour to the fact that Christina was observed leaving the castle with the party on the night of the kidnap attempt, and then returned looking, how shall we say, a little flustered. The king seeks champions to defend the honour of Christina, and it is a simple matter of carrying out this combat to determine what direction you might take the fallout. The third and final scenario of this event is during the wedding itself, the mood of which has been affected by the outcomes of the previous two scenarios. This scenario is little more than foreshadowing of events to come, and links to the Crones of Christic encounter later in the timeline. Essentially, it is a warning that storm clouds and dark days are coming. Whilst not really a scenario as such, this should get the players thinking about what dastardly occurrences are around the corner, and to get their proverbial houses in order. The two major events of the Frost Giant invasion and the Royal Wedding are really just vehicles to enhance the reputation of the player characters. Those who do well may end up with larger dominions and powerful allies. Those who don't, or those who avoid the events altogether, could find themselves having lands stripped away from them, depending really on the severity of how a DM might want to run the campaign. What's plain to see in how all these events play out is that there is very little hand-holding for the DM. With the two major events spanning just three pages, and the five Norwald encounters spanning just ten pages, the description of this campaign adventure being a framework becomes truer than ever, with only 13 out of the module's 32 pages being actual adventure scenarios. Here we have the DM being presented with information, and, basically, being told to get on with it. What's key to remember here, and what relates to my earlier comment about consulting with no one, is that this was written at a time when you and your group played in virtual isolation from other groups. So how you ran Test of the Warlords was completely up to you. In short, you couldn't get it wrong because it was your game, and the absence of access to thousands of people offering you the best way of running the game was actually empowering. How does the Frost Giant invasion work? Make a decision. What shall I do if the kidnap of Christina succeeds? Make a decision. How did the NPCs interact with the player characters? Make a decision. Your decisions can't be wrong, they just send your game in other directions. Test of the Warlords exploited this area of development for keen DMs wanting to wade through multiple scenarios and ideas and make them work together. I think framework is the perfect description for it, and I think we got more confident DMs because of it. Ok, so I touched on the NPC interactions there. Just who are these NPCs, and what are their affiliations? Because whilst everything else is going on, these NPCs are manoeuvring for power, and not all of them support Alphacia. I've listed all the NPCs here for you to look at, and included their allegiances. Now, considering the events over the two-year timeline I just went over, interactions with these NPCs could go in many directions. For instance, we're advised that if Christina is kidnapped, she is taken to the stronghold of Alak Dool. What happens beyond this is up to the DM. Clearly, Alak Dool is a Thiatian sympathiser, but so is Max I and Longtooth. We're given some sketchy information about how this affiliation might work, but with the potential for so many moving pieces in this campaign, the agility of the DM to weave their machinations through the timeline can be a real factor in making this a great adventure, and there's real potential here to corrupt player characters who are on the fence about who to support when things go south. In terms of NPCs without Thiatian sympathies, there is again a real opportunity to develop these further, 
or even have the odd dispute about the ownership of land where borders might be shared. The DM could flesh these personalities out any way they see fit. The key here is to ensure that an element of political tension is upheld, so that the players do not know who to trust when we come to the War of the Crown. The War of the Crown is the main event and the culmination of all previous activity. We are told that this should begin once the Crones of Christic scenario has been completed, with the characters being told by the Crones about the Thiatian forces making for the city of Landfall. It is at this point that the characters are expected to return to their dominions, gather their troops, and declare for either Alphacia, or if they're feeling particularly rebellious, Thyatis. The War of the Crown offers us two pages of information detailing the tactics and movements of each side, and the battle ratings of each force available to fight. Players are expected to have already determined their Dominion's forces battle rating when arranging their own defences. This is also where the outcomes of some of the timeline events can come into play, as the characters may be able to call on both Dwarven and Barbarian allies to fight for them. There is no stipulation that this has to be on the Alphatian side though. It's at this time when the Thiatian sympathising NPCs declare their allegiances openly and march against King Erikol. It may be that a character's dominion is in the way of the routes to the city of Alpha. If so, this battle will have to be resolved, with the outcome impacting on the direction of the attempted Thiatian conquest. Ultimately, this section of the campaign requires the careful administration of troop locations and movements. I would also include scouting missions and the odd skirmish here and there to mix up the proximity of peril to the characters. Although there are fewer Thiatian forces in the campaign, their troop numbers more than make up for this. Thinkol the Brave, Emperor of Thyatis, has thrown everything into this invasion. That said, the fate of the outcome rests on the roll of the dice. We are told that if Thyatis captures and holds Alpha for one month, then Norwald becomes part of the Thyatian Empire, with Alak Dul as its new king. Should Thyatis be routed, then defeat sets the empire back 50 years. How all this affects the characters depends on who they declared for. King Alak Dul sets about eliminating those that might oppose him, but might reward others who turned against Alphacia. However, those that stuck with a victorious King Erikol are once again rewarded with more lands and titles. At the end of this adventure, a player character may have quite a significantly sized dominion indeed. Although this brings Test of the Warlords to an end, it is far from the end of the adventures that characters can have in the region. The Continuing the Campaign chapter details opportunities to develop Dominion conflicts or encounters with the Dragons of Wormteeth range, which, we're told, houses around 1,000 dragons. Imagine the wealth contained therein. Norwald is there to be explored by your party, to facilitate the growth of their Dominions in a perilous part of the world. And as I mentioned earlier, with both Death's Ride and Saber River available to play, the region has got a lot going for it. And there you have it. Test of the Warlords by Douglas Niles. So what are my thoughts? Well, I think I've made that plain as I've gone through this review, but my biggest takeaway is that this module is, in fact, a primer in how to conduct companion level play and utilize all the new mechanics that came in the green box set. We're offered an opportunity to set up and administer a dominion. We're introduced to tournaments and how these might work. And brimming under the surface of all of that is the potential to use the war machine, to either advance your own borders or defend your lands. The presentation of the Worm's Teeth range is also a slight nod to the introduction of large and huge dragons that were absent from the previous box sets, making dragons difficult foes once again. And there are even locations called the Arch of Fire, which is a 75 mile arc of magma from one volcano's cone to another, and a 24 mile wide whirlpool in the Northern Sea, each enabling access to the Plains of Fire and Water respectively. So these locations build on the introduction to the multiverse that was also contained in the companion rules. If I have a criticism of this module, it's that the adventure sets up the Alphatians as the good guys and the Thiatians as the bad guys in a bit of a tropey way. I'd have liked the moral standpoint of both these empires presented in a much more ambiguous way, to make the player's decision about who to support during the War of the Crown a lot more difficult. I'd even consider changing some of the names of the NPCs. I mean, Alec Duel is a cool name, but it screams bad guy in such a way as he may as well be wearing a black Stetson. Otherwise, Test of the Warlords is the perfect embodiment of what separates Beckme from every other edition of D&D. It's got the kind of adventures and encounters you might expect, but it's also got Dominion administration and army building that makes it somewhat of a strategy-based sim. And when it's time to march, the game takes on an entirely different shape 
that harks back to D&D's earliest roots without losing the impact and influence of each individual character. It's the best of both wargaming and roleplaying and is, in my opinion, a standout adventure in the Beckme line. And with that, I hope you enjoyed my first Beckme Adventure module review. What's been your experience of Test of the Warlords? Did your players enjoy it? What was their reaction to Dominion play? Which side did they declare for? It would be great to know. Otherwise, please give this video a like if you did indeed like it, and please hit the subscribe button if I've earned your future attention. If you'd like to thank me further, you can buy me a coffee, link on the screen or in the description. I'm Bake Me Berserker, keep making your saving throws and I hope to see you back here soon.